Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm going to start the proceedings off with a presentation on the Interplex IP-Link uh, Synchrocast technology, which is a key element for RF simulcast uh, systems. IP-Link is the latest addition to the Interplex product line for broadcast application. Uh, besides IP-Link, Synchrocast is also implemented in our T1 and IP multiplexing uh, products. But today's presentation is going to focus on uh, the IP-Link version of the Synchrocast technology. Uh, and as Catherine mentioned, following my presentation, Hal Teller from Geo Broadcast Solution will uh, go through his presentation on the use case studies of uh, mm -hmm. RF systems uh, that uses uh, synchrocast technology. So, as a background, RF simulcasting is where multiple transmitter sites uh, in close proximity operate on the same uh, RF frequency, uh, sending the same program material uh, in the um, in the FM broadcast application, this is used to uh, expand the coverage uh, as well as uh, to fill the coverage gaps using uh, booster sites. Uh, in, uh, it's also extensively used in the public safety uh, communication uh, with uh, analog land mobile radio systems uh, where multiple smaller uh, booster sites are used to expand the coverage of the mobile radio system. So, so the biggest problem with RF simulcasting is in the overlap region. This is the area where the receiver is not captured by any one of the transmitter sites, and therefore it is receiving and processing signals from multiple uh, transmitter sites, and it, the, the signals are not precisely aligned or synchronized. Significant interference can, can, can occur because the signals are getting added destructively within uh, the receiver. Uh, within the OLAP region, as shown in the uh, diagram to the left, the relative signal strength between the transmitter uh, towers is, uh, is within 6 dB approximately. So the main idea behind Synchrocast is to align uh, these audio signals uh, coming from different transmitter sites in this OLAP region so that when they do get processed uh, simultaneously in the receiver, they get added constructively as opposed to destructively. And for that to happen, both the frequency and the phase of the signals uh, thing. So how do we achieve this precise uh, synchronization? So we have to align uh, the audio delay of the signals coming from these different transmitter sites into the OLAP region. Uh, and uh, this delay has two main components. Uh, there is the studio to transmitter uh, link delay, which is not in our control and can uh, vary over time. And there are several constant uh, delay components uh, related to the signal processing uh, in the various hardware elements in the in the in the chain, as well as the RF lifetime delay, which is the RF propagation uh, delay of the signal leaving the transmitter tower uh, and arriving at the receiver in the overlap region. The RF lifetime can be uh, calculated using uh, the speed of light constant. Uh, another key element of a simulcast system is the selection of the exciter and the transmitter platform. Not only they must have constant processing time across them, they must also have uh, the ability to use GPS reference uh, to lock the carrier and the pilot uh, signals. The gate says uh, Sexiva and Flexter, our line of exciters, uh, satisfy uh, this uh, requirement. And finally, signal, uh, system engineering uh, activity, which includes the path study, to figure out uh, the required power level and the delay that, that needs to be applied at the different transmitter sites is a very critical uh, step in, in aligning uh, the signals. Uh, Hal Neller will actually uh, uh, get into the detailed aspect of, uh, of this particular uh, point. So what is the role of Synchrocast? Well, Synchrocast plays a very crucial role in the audio alignment process by managing the STL uh, portion of the delay. Uh, this delay includes the delay across uh, the network uh, from studio to the transmitter site, uh, and also it includes the delay inside the IP link related to the processing. So the main function of Synchrocast is to output the signal at each transmitter site precisely with the delay that is programmed uh, by the user, which is also known as the target delay. And to do this uh, while overcoming the impairments that are posed by the underlying IP network, such as packet losses, uh, and, and jitter. One of the key elements in providing this precise delay is the use of GPS uh, reference within the IP link platform. So besides uh, 
uh, audio. Synchrocast also works uh, with a digital composite FM uh, multiplex signal, which is the AES-192 interface. So the target delay value that we talked about in the earlier slide is, is one of the most important parameters in the RF simulcast system. This is the parameter that is adjusted to align uh, the audio between transmitter sites in the overlap region. The target delay value must be greater than the, uh, the maximum network delay uh, that you expect. Plus, uh, it needs to include, include the delay inside the IP link for processing. And the total target delay has to be less than one second. This is what Synchrocast supports. One second is large enough uh, to support a wide range of IP network types for distribution, including uh, satellite. So the delay sources within IP link are encoding and uh, network reliability features if they are enabled. Once uh, the target delay value is configured in the IP link, the Synchrocast algorithm will maintain the delay of the signal to within one microsecond of that value which computes to approximately 300 meters of accuracy in the overlap region based on the speed of light uh, constant. Uh, another key capability of Synchrocast is that it will automatically uh, compensate for any changes in the STL network delay by adjusting its own internal delay such that the uh, delay of the signal at the output of the IP link in the transmitter site is at the target delay. This slide uh, shows you a use case example of a target delay value setting. In this uh, example, the user is, uh, uh, is trying to uh, equalize the delay between the two transmitter sites to 100 milliseconds. The target delay value that's actually configured in each IP link is 100 milliseconds. The top STL, STLAA, a already has a, a network delay of 75.4 milliseconds. So to get 200 milliseconds of delay out of the IP link 200, the internal synchrocast delay is set to 24.6 milliseconds. Uh, similarly, STLB has a network delay of 35.3 milliseconds, and to get 200 milliseconds of delay outside of that IP link, uh, the internal synchrocast delay is set to 64.7 milliseconds. Now the key point here is that once uh, this delay is set, if there is any variation or change in the, the link delay or the network delay, Synchrocast delay, internal synchrocast delay will be automatically adjusted up or down such that the target delay uh, of the signal does not change out of the uh, IP link. This is another example of the target delay value uh, setting. In this case, the equal delay line uh, does not overlap the equal signal line in the overlap region, so there is interference in the uh, overlap region. Uh, the target delay value setting between the two transmitter sites uh, here uh, is, is going to be offset uh, to move the equal delay line uh, over to the uh, equal signal line to overcome uh, the interference. So there are uh, challenges that Synchrocast uh, needs to overcome, especially when using ISP uh, networks for the STL links, uh, such as packet losses, jitter, and frequently changing uh, network delays. Uh, packet losses themselves will not cause Synchrocast uh, to lose the lock on the target delay, but packet losses can cause significant degradation in the audio quality, especially when you're using compressed audio signals. Therefore, Synchrocast is compatible with the network reliability features that are already built into the IP link, such as RTP level for error correction, which uses uh, uh, parity packets to recover lost packets, and it's very effective on random packet loss patterns. Interplex uh, stream splicing is, a, is another technique that we have. Uh, this is a packet duplication scheme uh, where the duplicate packets can be sent uh, either with time diversity or network diversity. Time diversity is where the duplicate packets are sent uh, with programmable time offset on the same network, and network diversity is where they are sent on, on independent network paths. Uh, stream splicing is very effective for burst packet losses. But the most important aspect of uh, the reliability technique is the scalability aspect, uh, meaning being able to add time diverse streams on top of network diversity, being able to add forward error correction on top of that, provides a very scalable solution to address a wide range of network conditions. And Synchrocast is uh, uh, compatible with all of this uh, uh, technique as long as the end-to-end -end delay is one second. Uh, one of the challenges uh, in, in uh, using IP networks for transport is understanding or knowing the packet loss patterns. Uh, understanding these patterns, you know, help us select the most effective and efficient 
packet loss mitigation technique. And this is where Intraplex uh, Live Look uh, comes in. Uh, Intraplex Live Look is an off-board PC application uh, which provides real-time analytics and recommendation on which uh, uh, technique to use for that network connection. So, for example, whether to use four-layer correction or stream splicing or combination of, uh, of, of them. Besides the analytics, it also uh, is a platform for monitoring and notification. So it has an option uh, to send email uh, notification to the users when network link conditions happen or whether the stream experiences high uh, packet losses. The monitoring uh, aspect of the tool will continuously lock the statistics from the IP link, will store it on the PC platform. This data can then be used uh, for a variety of different analytics, for example, monitoring the SLA or looking at the long-term trend of the network connection. Okay, to review the different reliable transport options uh, that we have that work with Synchrocast, if you have a single wide area network connection, you have the option of turning on uh, forward error correction uh, as a protection for the stream. This will work well as long as your packet loss patterns appear to be random, which is generally the case for a managed uh, network or you have the option of adding another time diverse stream to the group. Uh, this is a typical configuration that we see for a public network connection where we, we see not only random losses, but we also see high burst losses at, at times. And with high burst losses for their correction, uh, cannot recover all the lost packets, and therefore you have to use uh, stream splicing along with for their correction for reliability. If you have more than one wide area network connection, you can add additional streams uh, to the group for each available network. Uh, this is the type of configuration that uh, provides uh, headless uh, uh, protection when a single network fails. This is also the type of uh, configuration that provides uh, a key one type reliability uh, using two or more low cost IST uh, connections. So looking at the uh, internal architecture of Synchrocast on the studio side IP link, uh, the GPS block provides the timing reference for uh, for the system. The reference for the GPS can be the internal GPS receiver or the user can have an external GPS receiver. If they are using the external GPS receiver, uh, they supply both the 10 megahertz and 1 PPS uh, to the IP link. The PCM ingest uh, block uh, receives the audio or AES-192 samples uh, from the input channel, uh, marks them with the GPS timestamp, uh, sends both the uh, samples and the GPS timestamp to the encoding block, which provides the optional compression, and then onto the reliable transport block, uh, which provides the packet protection using uh, RTP level FEC or stream splicing. The key thing to note here is that because the samples are marked uh, with the GPS timestamp right at the ingest of the system, the delays in all the subsequent blocks uh, such as encoding, reliable transport, will all be accounted for when we calculate the end-to-end -end delay at the receiver end. So this slide uh, basically mentions uh, what I just uh, talked about. The key to note here is that uh, when you're using uh, the reliability technique, it will not only protect uh, the audio uh, data, but also the timestamps. Looking at the actual setup of Synchrocast on the studio side, the first step is uh, selecting the GPS reference for the system. The choices, as I said, are internal GPS or external GPS. If you select internal GPS, uh, you get additional information uh, coming from the GPS uh, receiver. The next step is to select the timing source uh, for the input channel that you're using for Synchrocast. Uh, and with Synchrocast, you have to select uh, GPS. If you're not in Synchrocast, the options are internal, or you can use AES, external AES timing. But with Synchrocast, you have to uh, select GPS option. And finally, the third uh, step is to check the use GPS timestamp checkbox box on the RTP transmit stream that you're using for Synchrocast. And that's it. Those are the three uh, steps that, that are required to set up Synchrocast on the studio side. Uh, looking at the Synchrocast architecture on the receive side, uh, IP link, you can see that the block diagram is a little bit more busy. Uh, this is also where the user programs the target delay value. Uh, as the packets arrive over the wide area IP network, they first get placed in the receive buffer, 
Uh, this is also known as the jitter buffer. You might have heard that term. Uh, this is where the uh, uh, duplicate packets are detected and discarded, and you will get a lot of duplicate packets if you're using uh, techniques such as string splicing. Uh, this is also where if the packets are arriving out of sequence, they get uh, resequenced and put in proper sequence in the, in the buffer. The reliable transport block, or internally what we call is the receive block, gets a periodic trigger from the PLL block to dequeue a packet from the receive buffer, which has both the audio samples plus the, the transmit side, the studio side GPS timestamp. The packet is sent to the decoding block, which performs the option of the compression, and finally out to the PCM output uh, for, for, for sending the data out. Now that flow is pretty straightforward. Uh, the key to note here is that the timestamp from the studio side is carried across all the blocks in the studio side uh, path as well as on the, on the receiver block. The complication for uh, Synchrocast uh, occurs in the adapt logic block. This is uh, where it continuously compares the transmit side GPS timestamp from with the local GPS timestamp at that moment, uh, the PCM output, uh, to determine the current delay of the signal. If that uh, delay does not match the target delay, it will then apply an algorithm uh, to adjust the rate of the PLL, which in turn will change the depth of the uh, received buffer, which will then change the delay of the signal passing through the IP link system. So this received buffer that you see here, the depth of the received buffer is the synchrocast uh, delay or the internal IP link delay that we talked about a few slides ago, which is adjusted either up or down uh, to achieve the target uh, delay value. So you want to have some slack uh, in that receive buffer to compensate for any uh, network variation that might occur. Uh, so when you're calculating the target delay value, you not only have to account for the internal IP link processing or for encoding, decoding, plus the reliability block, but you also want to take into account the maximum network delay variation uh, that you want to support. And this is especially important when you're using ISP networks. So as I mentioned, the depth of the receive buffer is how we adjust the, uh, the delay of the uh, signal through the system. And there are two modes of adjusting the depth of the uh, buffer. We have the hitless mode and the hitful mode. Uh, hitless mode uh, has no audible disruptions uh, because the maximum deviation of the PLL uh, is capped at 100 ppm. So basically what this means is that you will be playing the audio out faster or slower uh, by 100 ppm, which cannot be audibly perceived. Uh, this mode does take longer to converge because of the constraint on the, the ppm. Uh, it takes 10 seconds to move one millisecond of delay in either direction. The hitful or fast adjust mode uh, provides a quicker convergence by either adding or removing packets in the receive buffer. So if your delay is off by more than a packet interval, the fast adjust will quickly get you to within a packet interval. From there on, the hitless adjustment takes over. Uh, when that uh, action occurs, adding or removing the packet, you will hear an audio glitch, but with this mode, the convergence, uh, when this mode is on, the convergence is much faster. So once the target delay uh, is locked, uh, and uh, if a GPS signal is lost, the system will go into the whole So looking at the setup of the sync pass on the receive side, again, the first step is to select the GPS reference for the system. And this uh, configuration here does not need to follow what you set on the studio side. On the studio side, you could be using an internal GPS receiver. Uh, and uh, on the receiver side, you could be using an external GPS receiver, vice versa. The second step uh, is uh, to select the uh, timing source for the output channel that you're using for Synchrocast. And with IP Link 200, which has two channels, Synchrocast operates independently for each uh, channel. So the channel that you're using, uh, the Synchrocast uh, mode, you set the timing source to GPS, just like what you did on the transmit side. You check the Synchrocast mode checkbox. Uh, you program the target delay value. Uh, the class recovery mode is the fallback uh, option in case the GPS signal is lost. Uh, the options are adaptive or fixed. You generally want to keep it fixed in case the GPS signal is lost momentarily, so you hold the delay. But if it's lost for a while, you can change that to adaptive on the fly. The fast adjust mode, uh, which we just talked about, is also an option. Uh, you want to keep it on 
uh, to quickly converge if your delay is off by more than a packet. And, and that's it. There is no special uh, stream level configuration on the receiver as we had on the transmit side. All the receive streams that you uh, create and tie to that, this particular channel will automatically be in the synchrocast mode. Once the configuration is set, uh, this is uh, the page that also shows you the status. It will show you the current delay that the system is measuring, as well as the synchrocast status, whether it's lost, or no error, uh, or whether it's making adjustment at the moment, or it's an error. Now, one of the error conditions could be that the user has requested a target delay value, which is less than the network delay value plus the IP link processing delay combined. Uh, in that case, the Synchrocast will not be able to converge into an error. And there are other error conditions as well which are uh, documented uh, and, uh, and the appropriate text is sent out on the alarm log. So one of the, the critical uh, the aspect of uh, figuring out the uh, target delay value is, is to know it precisely what the studio to transmitter link uh, delay is, the one-way uh, packet delay is, and uh, to Support that IT link uh, uh, system has a built in tool uh, that will measure the delay, the one way delay, using GPS timing and reference. And so it's very accurate. It's like the synchrocast version of one way thing utility, except it's a lot more accurate. Okay, to summarize the key points uh, that we talked about the audio signal uh, from different transmitter. Uh, the delay of the audio signals from different transmitter sites needs to be precisely aligned uh, in the OLAP region to overcome the interference. This delay includes the delay uh, across the SPL, plus the exciter delay, uh, plus the RF flight time delay. Uh, besides, the excite, uh, besides the SPL delay, which is not in our control, all of the delays are constant or measurable or, or predictable. The target delay value is the most important parameter uh, in, uh, in, in the RF final cast system. This is the parameter that is adjusted to align the audio signals in the OLAP region. Uh, this is what gets programmed in the IP link at the receiver, at the transmitter site. The main function of Synchrocast is uh, to precisely delay the audio signal at the transmitter site uh, by the target delay at all times and maintain that delay. And finally, uh, Synchrocast works with compressed audio format, which significantly reduces the STL bandwidth requirement, and it is compatible with the network reliability features of IPLink. Both of these uh, capabilities uh, reduce the operational expense for an RF simulcast system by enabling the use of the low-cost RSP connection. Thank you. Uh, here, thank you very much. I just want to say here has been a big help to us in some very tricky situations with uh, a combination of trying to synchronize boosters and HD radio uh, time alignment at the same time. Uh, so now we're going to talk about max casting, which is uh, the portion that Geo Broadcast Solutions brings to the table, utilizing the gate there hardware uh, and the engineering that uh, Geo Broadcast can provide to actually create the network for you. Today we're going to cover a little background on why the GBS solution is different than other SFNs. We'll have a case study with two OCOA stations in Cumberland, Maryland, and another case study in uh, Tampa, St. Pete, Florida, and a third one in Albany, New York, where the coverage was the desire to get over into uh, past the mountains in Massachusetts. We picked these because they all represent different applications uh, but all solve the same problem, which is to provide a good signal to folks where otherwise they would not receive them. And by the way, there's been a lot of buzz about this lately, but it will also help for those PPM markets to enhance the uh, PPM uh, portable people meter, people meter coverage uh, in those situations. So why is max casting different from other on-channel boosters? Well, first, it's been dedicated to years of research and development, and our lead engineer, Bill Hyatt, has worked in broadcast, mobile, cellular industries, and PS Labs was contracted to verify the work. They coordinated listener tests to determine interference thresholds. And we have highly experienced partners, JamPro for antennas and combiners, Gates Air for transmitters, IP connectivity, and the SynchroCast system. And I should add recently that we have a preferred provider, American Tower, who is helping us to uh, provide antenna sites for customers, and we, in fact, have gotten some very good rates from them for some of these things so we can help uh, with the site acquisition issues as well. 
Many of you are familiar with on-frequency repeaters or boosters. Many will have stories of unsatisfactory performance. Some have created more problems than they solve with distorted audio or multipath, weak coverage, interference back to the primary transmitter signal, and some were problematic enough and were just turned off. It's an SFN repeater system, but that's where the similarity ends. It brings new technologies to SFN networks to resolve those performance issues we just talked about with research into parameters that determine the simulcast interference, advanced geographic tools to intelligently design repeater networks, we calculate the coverage, the population, the signal levels, we show interference areas, and we conduct the total population, factoring those interference areas out. And when we model in big cities, the models include the building clutter and obstructions as well as the terrain. NPR Labs was contracted to do simulations of primary transmitter and max caster repeater signals. They used both the Rayleigh mobile fading and fixed signals, processing with professional broadcast hardware, and the receivers were standard consumer models, both home and car. NPR Labs also got us uh, into some listener tests to measure consumers' opinions of max casting design parameters with Towson University and Dr. Ellen Sheffield, who's well-renowned in this area. They determined the listener keep-on scores, those mean opinion scores, and accumulated 19,000 data points uh, in the process. The listeners evaluated mono and stereo modes, speech, music, and voiceover, time of arrival between signals, the ratio of RF between the signals, and they were first compiled as tables and then as surface charts. When I mentioned the keep-on scores before, our goal is to stay up in this area here, which is 90%. That was determined to be the threshold uh, of where listeners, in our minds, would not consider interference. Below 90%, we call it interference, even though everyone won't necessarily leave that top 10%. Uh, we, we used to determine what that interference level is because, frankly, there had been really no uh, industry consensus as to exactly what you needed to have uh, for interference before it became an issue. Directional antennas are very important in shaping the patterns and controlling the interference and yet serving the area that's very important. Jampro has developed the Java antenna. Uh, it can be used in either a single or a dual array. And that's what it might look like. We typically will use a 30-degree slant polarization. You'll see a picture of this uh, a little bit later on. Here's kind of just a block of what the system would look like. Uh, this particular one would be four nodes. Some uh, systems have a single node. Some might have uh, more than four. It just depends upon what the customer is trying to accomplish. Out of this, some proprietary formulae were developed. Power ratios, the timing differential, the antenna patterns that we just discussed. Software, which has been customized for modeling and predicting of coverage and interference. With advanced modeling procedures to mitigate or even eliminate interference regardless of the terrain. The coverage and interference, we actually tune after we measure the performance in the field of what the station's existing signal is. Then we tune the model to the real world. Typically, uh, the measurements are pretty close to the predictions, but in a few cases, uh, it has been off. And that can be because of uh, what's considered to be an omnidirectional antenna may not actually be omnidirectional. Uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the multipath is higher than our model would have predicted or whatever. We also uh, believe that multiple low-power, low-height transmitters are better, strategically placed to cover the desired area. Space optimally to provide the coverage filling. Could be a highway, could be building penetration, depending upon what you're looking for. The frequency and modulation are synchronized with each other, and the primary transmitter using the Gates Air IP200 was synchrocast. The distribution to the sites must be stable. Could be a private IP network, could be a T1. Uh, audio compression can be used to limit the uh, SCL bandwidth as well, which is new in this IP200 that here was just talking about uh, before we had to use uncompressed linear in the system. We 
We also learn to keep the radiation going in line with the main signal. Don't cross it or point it towards the uh, main signal. You must have identical equipment in the chain at all sites, the same exciters, use a common processor. This new generation of equipment is more stable and offers more options than the older gear. It also offers two station capabilities, so it can be very cost effective for those who want to operate two stations through the same network. The use of proper software for modeling as trial and error in the field is extensive and often does not yield the desired results. So here's the first case study. This is a customer in West Virginia who was desiring to get a good signal into Cumberland, Maryland. There's actually two stations here. You can see the parameters. This is, this is the contour from one of the stations. And this is the contour from the other station. We'll show you the path profiles here. You can clearly see that we do not have first Fresnel zone clearance. There's certainly not line of sight. And any FM reception would be possible only by diffraction and reflection. And Cumberland is over in here or in here in the case of the two stations. So you can see they're pretty badly blocked. The customer tried an omnidirectional booster on his own. We mapped it using our predictive software. They had no uh, synchronization in this case. They used a 1200 watt ERP and the magenta is the interference area. And you can see the interference is, is quite massive. So they came to us and we designed a two node system. You can see the red here. This is the station's contour. This one here just comes right up to it. And this other, other node here is a bit to the west. I'll show you in a second why it was two overlapping booster sites. Here's what we ended up with. You can see the interference is considerably reduced here. We ended up with a 400 watt and a 750 watt node. But the area of interest which is in here, had basically no signal from the main transmitter site. This gives you a little bit of a look about how ugly the, uh, the terrain is and what we're traveling over to get into Cumberland. This will also give you on the left what their original signal looked like and what it looks like after the max casting installation. Let me tell you a little about these numbers. This is a percent, 47.45 percent of the area in the left-hand map was interference. After the max casting was installed, under 5 percent of the area was interference. You can see the both a total area of 174 square kilometers. So significant reduction in interference. Um, the important thing to point out is you can see on the right-hand map, a lot of the interference is in these white areas. Well, the white areas didn't have signal to begin with, so we're really not losing any area there to interference. It wasn't served in the first place. And in some situations, we can actually install another node to eliminate the interference uh, if that happens to fall into a populated area. Here's their second station. As an ERP of 13 kilowatts, and you can see in here, this is Cumberland, all this white area here, right where they want to serve. Not that far away from the transmitter, but it sure doesn't get in there due to that unfavorable terrain. Again, looking at the path profile, Cumberland's down here on the left, and you can see they got a pretty high transmitter site, but that's pretty ugly terrain. So this particular one has a single node. You can see it's one millivolt contour. And this is the station 54 dBU contour because that's a class D. So we're allowed to go out to the 54 dBU. And on this station, you can see the before and the after coverage. And that's just a close up. So the whole populated area of Cumberland uh, now receives uh, at least a 65 dBU signal. Uh, in some cases, a little bit more. Uh, so we have good indoor, 
building penetration, and we certainly have a great car radio signal there. Well, sometimes the installations aren't so easy. We went to install the antenna here, and you can see there's a guy up in the tree here with a chainsaw trying to cut down the tree that's growing up against the tower. Then we have a single Java antenna in the middle, uh, slanted at 30 degrees. And here is a perfect example on the right. This, this node was put in specifically to fill in an area of highway that otherwise would be lost. And that's why those two nodes are close together. Uh, the first one on, on further to the west covers this highway, and the second one pushes a very good signal down into Cumberland itself. But without both of those nodes, we would not be able to do this. And the customer uh, had a problem on this highway, and they'd lose a lot of listeners as they were driving around because this, this stretch had, had virtually no signal. This case study is WSUN, Holiday, Florida, which is in the Tampa St. Pete market. The reason we picked this one for a case study is that uh, normally boosters are put in when you have severe terrain blockage and you're trying to cover an area, and the terrain is your friend because it minimizes the interference. But in this particular case, if you've ever been to this area of Florida, it's as flat as a pancake, and there is no terrain interference. Uh, so we have nothing here stopping the signal except distance. WSUN does not have a great signal even out to their one millivolt contour. You can see here there's there's a fair amount of white area. So our task was to fill in some of that uh, north of that contour. I mentioned before about the drive test that we do for the signal readings. This particular situation, we had a 98 percent correlation between the predicted model and the measured model. You can see this was driving around a lot of the area there just to, uh, to verify that. They happen to be in this northern portion of St. Petersburg. Color's a little hard to see here, but right there is their studio. And they happen to have about a 120-foot FTL tower out in the back of the parking lot. It was pretty much perfect for what this scenario is. You can see this, this booster puts its signal right down to their 60 dBU contour. You can also see from the coloration in here that we've done a pretty good job of filling in what looked like this before. Looking at the numbers, for example, uh, we would add about 59,000 people for car radio reception in that area. And we would add um, about uh, another 8,000 of indoor penetration. So it's, it's pretty significant. And this does not even cover what's going on down this highway, I-275. A lot of traffic. That's a key road in the uh, commuter hours in that market. The ultimate plan is to build this out even a little bit further. Put a node to the west over here. And this is a clever little thing. This particular broadcaster purchased a translator on their co-channel frequency that was about 30 miles south of their contour. And the goal is to hop that, uh, that translator right up underneath the contour here, protecting the contour and filling in this area of St. Petersburg, which is very highly populated, both with residential and commercial, and in essence, extending the signal contour beyond what its normal location would be. This is one of the few instances where over land we're allowed to extend the contour. We can extend it over water, but over land we have to protect it, unless you can do something creative like this. We also had mapped for them, I don't have it here, but we had mapped for them what the interference would be if that translator were turned on where the original CP was issued and it was not synchronized. And uh, it would bring interference right up to their 60 dBU contour. They'd lose signal area uh, listeners even where they are outside their contour now. That would be just lost uh, once that interference hit. Here's just a close-up view on the left. We have the now. And uh, before, I should say, and uh, on the right, we have the after. Uh, again, the magenta, there's not much of it. Um, 
and I think that's another thing we wanted to show here is how little interference there is. Um, but what little interference there is was principally in areas that showed in white before, like this. So we're not really taking away signal areas. We're, 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 we're just showing that there is some interference that would be over there. Now, what could we do about that? We could, if we needed to, plant a small node to fill in right here. If we wanted to, we could also come over here and do another one. So it's a very modular approach. You can put in as many of these as you wish uh, following the rules inside your contour. Here's what an installation might look like. Um, that's a gate there, um, 500 watt transmitter. Sometimes we use as low as a 50 watt transmitter, but they wanted to have headroom in here to be able to put HD radio on it eventually. Uh, and then here is an IP link 200, and this is an RDS. Coder. And you can see the uh, two antennas going up there side by side in a slant configuration near the top of that tower. In this case, those are dual Shively antennas. And our last case study is WAMC in Albany, New York. This is a grandfathered bee. It, it has a very large footprint, but in many areas due to the terrain, uh, a rather poor signal. The area that they tasked us with fixing is Northampton, which is um, on the Connecticut River, um, right towards the edge of their of their contour. Right here you see their contour. We located a, a site for them uh, on a tower owned by uh, Saga Communications, uh, who happened to have several of their radio stations located on it. So uh, WAMC has leased space on that tower. And what we've done is uh, at 46 meters above ground level, and that's a pretty high site there, 236 meters above sea level, uh, we have uh, placed their booster. In this particular case, we've added 52,000, almost 53,000 people uh, for uh, car radio and about uh, 5,500 people for indoor uh, reception. So pretty substantial. And... Uh, all caused primarily uh, due to bad terrain between this area and their main transmitter site. So that's what their tower looks like on the left. You can see there's a lot of stuff on it. And here's the crew assembling the dual uh, Jampro uh, array that will be hoisted up on that tower. Uh, that is all I have for the moment. Um, you're welcome to uh, share some questions uh, by typing them in the Q&A if you haven't already, and uh, either Kiora or myself will be happy to try to uh, answer them for you. Thank you, Hal. If anyone has any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the top, and both Hal and Kiora will be able to see your questions. Uh, how do you have the maps that cover the whole world? Um, I would say most of the populated world, yes, um, we we do. Um, and and we've actually done some in Australia and and some other places. So yes, we can we can cover most places. Perhaps uh, not above uh, above the Arctic Circle or something, but uh, you know certainly in the populated areas. Can you see this question from Steve Hill? What model are you using in the ICS telecom? Yes, there was a slide that had the exact name of that. It's the model 525 de Gout 1994. Okay. They consider that more accurate than the the um, the ITU or the Longley Rice predictions. And then there's a question: How is the synchronization maintained when the booster is off the direct line, as would be the case for multiple booster transmitters, as shown in Florida, for example? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Let me see if I can open this. Uh, it's in the public chat. Yeah. On the, yeah. 
when uh, as we oh well, what we do is is we arrange the physical location of the boosters to serve the area that we're trying to cover and and put them back towards the direction of the radiating signal from the main so that we don't cross over the um, the main radiation. Uh, and by using highly directional antennas, we can we can protect them from each other. But the proximity of the zones, if they're if they're close together, the timing will be pretty accurate. It's, it's when you start getting over the greater distances, the timing uh, the timing is going to shift. There's another one below that. What about the effects to HD radio from your main site, or can you do HD as well? Um, Right now, we can't do HD radio. That's strictly a function of the Gen 4 card uh, from Gates Air, which will support HD radio, but the software for that application has not yet been uh, been released. So right now, we would synchronize the analog of the boosters to the host station, but when the software update is done, uh, putting in the Gen X, the Gen 4 card, will allow us to add the HD radio, which would, of course, carry multicast and whatever else uh, the particular station's HD is carrying. So, uh, yes, it can be added in the future. I can answer that other one. The one on the connection? Yeah. So, there's a question on uh, what the studio to transmitter link uh, uh, network connection uh, would be, whether T1 or Internet uh, is available. If you use IP link 200, it has to be IP-based. If you have only have T1, then you have to use our T1 multiplexer product to uh, to implement Synchrocast technology. So basically, the answer is depending on what you have, we have a product uh, uh, that can handle it. You, you can also use the T1 to IP converter. Yes, you can. Any more questions? Got to thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your attendance.